Tomasz Suglaczek, ja został wspomniany, ma lat zaledwie 34 i to niedługo skończy te 34, 34 urodziny dopiero przed nami, ale już kiedy zaczynał swoją karierę po skończeniu studiów w wieku lat 24, był doradcą prezydenta Wacława Hawla. Sam mówi, że to trochę problematyczne, zaczynać od samej góry swoją karierę, ale mamy nadzieję, że jeszcze jest wiele miejsc, do których może dojść, ale w samych Czechach jest niewiele, w których go jeszcze nie było. Jest doradcą premiera, jest członkiem Rady Ekonomicznej Republiki Czeskiej przy rządzie Republiki Czeskiej, także członkiem jednego z funduszy przeciwkorupcyjnych, a także doradcą między innymi w Parlamencie Europejskim. Cała lista wymieniania tego, gdzie był Harvard, Yale, Google, e, wpad światowy, to zajęłoby nam co najmniej drugie tyle, a myślę, że najlepiej przemówi to, co sam Tomasz będzie chciał Państwu powiedzieć. Przed Państwem Tomasz Sydaszki. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a great honor and thank you very much for, 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 for publishing uh, the book and thank you for, uh, for, for being here. <coughs> I suggest... Well, I was told to speak in English, so I can also do Czeski. So, who wants English? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> it's a pity that Czechs and Poles have to speak together in English, but this is the way the cookie crumbles. So. But there's translation if you... Uh, uh, and that's so let me speak for, for some while, let me speak for maybe 20-30 minutes and uh, then let's go into the debate. I would much rather use uh, this time to debate the issues that are um, at hand for you. But of course interrupt me at any time while I'm speaking. Uh, that would be uh, more pleasurable for me than having a monologue. This is not the age of monologues anymore. Uh, it's the age of um, uh, interaction and of course wisdom should be found in mutual interaction between people that are likely... Uh, can you switch it off, please? I have a terrible feeling that somebody's watching over my back. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's really see and start... I, I want to tell you two stories, the fiscal policy story and the monetary policy story from the perspective really of uh, maybe the, 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 the new myths and modern myths, just to show uh, how these things are really inter interconnected. So, you know, today we are in a situation of having um, a depression, a crisis, or whatever you want to call it. Now, let's try and see the oldest ever business cycle in the history of mankind, and let's see if there's something that we can learn from it. So, question number one is, do you recall the oldest business cycle uh, in the history of mankind? And it was a, 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 a real question. <laughs> huh? The older. This was way before Netherlands existed. <laughs> Sorry for all the Dutchmen. <laughs> you were not the first. Excellent, yes. This is Genesis 41. Uh, the first book of Moses is the first um, ever a business cycle in the history of, of mankind. There's nothing older than this. So you know the story, everybody knows the story, except to connect the story is, um, is uh, rarely done. So what happened, just to recapitulate, uh, you know, Pharaoh has a dream. He dreams about, you know, seven fat cows. I always have to be very careful not to look on anybody. <laughs> seven fat cows and, and seven lean cows. And um, he doesn't know what to make of it. So he calls for, for Joseph and says, can you please explain what this means? And Joseph says, congratulations, Pharaoh. You just had the first macroeconomic prediction in your dream 14 years ahead of time. So, can, you, can, you, can you switch it? Yeah. So uh, in other words, you're going to have seven years of uh, fast, grain, or today we would say GDP, uh, and after that you will have seven, seven bad years. And Pharaoh says, well, thank you very much. Um, now give me an advice what to do with it. And Joseph says, um, well, it's quite easy. In the good years, do not eat everything that grows so that in the bad years you will not die of hunger. In other words, build grain houses, 
and store your energy uh, in them. This is called saving. Uh, when I lecture to my American friends, I always remind them that this word still exists in Wikipedia. And it basically means that before you buy something, you go through this purgatory of actually having to limit yourself um, in your consumption. And then, of course, invest it. This is a word that we know already very well. Invest the energy uh, into, into the values. In other words, here we are manipulating with energies and we are shifting them in time. Okay, so far so good. Uh, um, what is the morale of the story? What can we learn today? Well, first of all, uh, the reason for the business cycle. Now, this is something uh, for those of you who have a little bit of education in, in, in biblical studies on theology, you know that most of the Old Testament stories were uh, done to show a moral point. Everything that happened was a consequence of moral or immoral deed. This one is one of the rare exceptions. It is not explained why this happened. This is a legacy that we have till today. We cannot say what really causes the business cycle, what really causes uh, the crisis. Of course, we have many theories, but none of them explain it uh, to the point that you can actually predict it. The second question is, what revealed the future? So Pharaoh had a dream. What reveals the future today? Models. Or science. Okay, now, if you look at it, this seems to be very distant from each other. Dream is subjective, it's fuzzy, it's um, non scientific, and it's um, uh, uh, very difficult to understand. It kind of takes in many things, and you, you dream um, in, in pictures cows in this sense. Whereas models are supposed to be objective, verifiable, empirically tested, and uh, uh, objective. But if you actually take a second uh, thought about it, there is not such a huge gap between dreams and models. What do I mean? Well, let's, uh, let's take uh, Rene Descartes, the well, sort of uh, founder of, of scientific approach, he started this whole approach using also dreams. So he dreamed an ideal which then became the scientific method. Also we, when we construct our models, in a way we have to close our eyes and dream the relationship, which don't really exist in reality, but we put, we put, we put plus plus signs, and you're going to get every third word. Uh, plus signs and minus signs. Well, I think I need to go back. <laughs> huh? This is lesson for minus. minus. So, uh, models are also not real. Models are pure fiction. It is something that we invent to describe reality, although we know that it's not true. In a way, uh, uh, scientific method uses as if um, trick. For example, the free fall. When we talk about the free fall, we calculate it much easier when we think as if there is no friction of air. Of course, there is friction of air. We would all die very quickly if there wouldn't be a friction of air. But it's a useful abstraction. It's a useful trick. We trick nature by supposing many of its components away. So in economics, we call it ceteris paribus, and we suppose this and this, that away, and, and we build uh, the model there. Now, let's get a little bit more practical. This was just sort of a methodological uh, point. The role of economists, and if we agree here that Joseph was sort of a first economist, was never to increase GDP as it is often uh, wrongfully uh, thought of today. Even the role of political economists was not to increase GDP. The role of economists was to decrease the amplitude of a business cycle. So, in some years, the role of economists was to decrease consumption and decrease GDP growth, which is somewhat 
contrary to what we, what we hear today, when the popular voice has it that the role of economists is to increase GDP. Uh, we are allowed to increase GDP only here, when it comes to the fiscal policy. Okay, now let's fast forward till today, uh, over the span of 3,000 years, and see how we have behaved during, during this period. We also, as a civilization, had seven, or a period of very strong growth. Interestingly enough, um, this is just a pure coincidence, this period was bracketed by two very significant events. One was 9-11, uh, 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 2001, and, uh, which really changed many things in the world. It is one of the most significant dates that we have. This is also the last uh, year where American budget was in surplus. This is the year when Fed started dramatically decreasing interest rates. And this is the year that the role of America really, really changed. Now, another important event was the collapse of Lehman Brothers, which is kind of the height of, of the crisis. And this also happened in September uh, of 2009. It was on the 15th. So not exactly uh, seven years, but, but pretty close. Now, of course, this I think is a coincidence and it doesn't by no means mean that the crisis will last for seven years, although it looks more and more like it. Um, what's important here is, what did we do during the periods of, of high growth? Uh, am I speaking slow enough? Yeah? Okay. Uh, during these fat years, uh, I could easily show you the graph, but I don't have it with me. Majority of our civilization not only consumed everything that we had, in other words, enjoyed GDP growth to the full, but on the contrary, uh, we actually often went into debt. So, fourth point is, um, how on earth could we do this? The very message, which is 3,000 years old, and which we know for a long time that the economy goes in cycles, we kind of threw that away, and with all our sophisticated econometric models, we were sort of unable to see something that, um, or a story, uh, something that, that we know the economy behaves like this, um, first of all. Second of all, this story is something that we tell to seven-year-old ch children. And yet, it carries with it more wisdom than I think is the con con conventional wisdom of economists. Because what we've done today, this is sort of Keynesianism, in a way. Only Keynes, from today's perspective, would be an extreme right-winger. We, with our macroeconomic policy today, we are left of Keynes. Uh, and the best way how to describe today's uh, political economy is uh, Keynesian bastard. We've taken that you can run deficits, but we, because it's a little too confusing, we were running deficits pretty much uh, even during the good years. So Keynes allowed deficits in the lean years, providing that you save up for them before, or you pay them back mm -hmm. shortly, shortly after. Mm. Of course, in terms of monetary policy, uh, let's start with fiscal policy. Fiscal policy, this means running budget surpluses, uh, and this means running budget deficits. As you can see, surpluses and deficits is something that allows you to uh, transmute energy in time, making it a uh, little more bearable in the bad years. And in terms of uh, monetary policy, this is also easy. Uh, here you uh, increase interest rate, oh yes, interest rates, and here you decrease interest rate. This is, of course, economy 101. Now, uh, let's have a situation, now let's take a look on the situation from, from the vantage point of these two, these two hands. These are the only hands, really, the government has in terms of macroeconomic policy to influence somewhat the development of economics. Now, monetary policy, and here I will also tell a story, 
So this story I wanted to illustrate with, a, with an old story, and this story I will illustrate with a, with a modern myth, and that myth is called Lord of the Rings. Both of these cannot really increase the energy in the economy. Both of these are sort of cheats, if you want. The only thing they do is they uh, manipulate uh, energy in time. So monetary policy. Okay, if you take a loan, it looks like you're taking a loan from a bank or from a friend or from uh, maybe your uh, mother-in-law. But what you're really doing is you're just reshuffling your future consumption taking it away and laser pointing it to present. So if somebody takes a loan of 10,000 euros, only a fool would say that that person is 10,000 euros richer. It's a loan. But when the government does this, that's exactly how we perceive it. So government takes a 3% uh, of GDP deficit, in one year, and let's say that same year GDP grows by 3%. If an individual does it, no, need, no, no reason to celebrate. When a government does it, everybody, including the analytics, analytics, jump up and down celebrating that we are 3% richer. It's a loan. So this is not GDP in terms of gross domestic product, but it's GDP in terms of gross debt product. These 3% were not really produced by anything else except by, by, by debt. And what we do here is you take your energy from the future and you invest it right now, hoping that you will be able to pay it back and maybe even hoping that you will invest the money wisely and you will make uh, a little, little money on that. But the basic idea of, of monetary and fiscal policy is shuffling here with energies. So let's now turn to, to monetary policy. Uh, let me use first an analogy from, from Lord of the Rings and second the analogy from alcohol. This I think is something that we Czechs and Poles have to, together. We understand how it works. How is alcohol, how is, okay, let's start somewhere else. Monetary policy is basically nowadays uh, interference with, with the basic interest rate. Interest rate is something that has a very interesting history, and I tried to go into it in the book, uh, in the history of, of, of thought and in the history of economy. Those of you who've studied a little bit of history of economic thought know that interest rate is one of the first and oldest problems that philosophers and thinkers, when it came to economics, devoted their time. And all of them, starting from Moses, going through Aristotle, uh, even Quran, Vedas, uh, all the way till Thomas Aquinas, they all said the same thing about interest rate. Don't do it. We don't know why. It's treacherous. We don't understand what's happening. We don't understand it. We can't control it. It's a dangerous animal. Do not use it or minimize the usage of it. This is basically the argumentation that Aristotle has. Um, he kind of guessed that it has something to do with time. And even Aristotle here isn't really sure why he doesn't like interest rates, so he uses theological arguments saying, you know, interest rate, uh, money is something that is non-productive, unlike a field. So if you lend money, you're really making um, interest rate on time. Time doesn't belong to you, time belongs to God, says Aristotle, and you, you cannot charge people interest rate of something that does not belong to you. Well, this argumentation is, of course, very weak, uh, and even Aristotle kind of knew it, so he's, he, he didn't give it too much uh, thought, but I think he got it right that the, that the time, that the thing that is at, at hand here is time. We today have made interest rate a core um, component, a pillar, if you want, of our societies. Not only practically, our society today would be practically unimaginable without interest rate, without, without loans. But also in theory, be it manipulation with monetary policy or, you know, calculating wages. In theory, we, you have to know the interest rate or the marginal rate of productivity of capital in order to, 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 to sort of come to terms with, with uh, marginal productivity of labor or, or wages. 
Now, what's the problem with interest rate? Why were they so afraid of it? And why are we now so ready to use it? Well, I think the basic problem with interest rate is, again, uh, a dangerous manipulation with, um, with time energy. Money travels in time. So, you know, in Star Trek, the sort of beam me up, Scotty, uh, we already have that today, and the transmuting machine is called interest rate. If we didn't have interest rate, you could not shift money in time so easily. Now, how is interest rate similar to alcohol? Well, alcohol can also uh, time travel energy. Uh, it, it can do so only over short distances of time, usually one or two days. So, uh, a specific example, on a Friday evening, when you're, you know, very happy, lots of energy, suddenly everybody's beautiful, you know how to sing, and you know how to talk to, to wonderful, strange people that actually talk back to you. Um, we have a common mistake, we think that this extra joissance, this extra energy, is due to alcohol. No, it isn't. The only thing that alcohol does is that it moves your Saturday morning energy onto a Friday evening. But, <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the energy of the weekend is constant. Yeah? You can't really add much more energy here. So drinking alcohol on a Friday evening is quite fine if you know that there's nothing serious happening on a, Monday mo uh, on a, on a uh, Saturday morning. And we can reasonably predict what's going to happen the next day. Now, it is not very clever to get drunk on a Sunday evening if you have something very important, exams or, or, or business travel or, or important meeting on a Monday morning. So you can only get drunk, so to speak, if you know that you have excess energy to land on. Now, here I think is the problem of interest rate. Uh, when it comes to alcohol, it can only shuffle energy, as I already said, over short distances of time. Whereas interest rate can do so easily over the uh, span of 40 years. And the thing is, we never know, we fundamentally will never know, no matter how good our models will be, what will happen 40 years later, and if, unfortunately, we might land up with a hangover onto a very important Monday morning, and then, of course, that will have its, uh, its terrible results. Last analogy, and then I will wait, and then I will end. This is, of course, only one story that I chose to pick. Um, if you have something very powerful, uh, sometimes it's better not to use it. In Lord of the Rings, there's a Actually, talking about the Lord of the Rings, as an economist, if you read the Lord of the Rings, you immediately have to ask yourself, okay, this trilogy is called the Lord of the Rings, so the proper question is, who is the Lord of the Rings? Who's the CEO? Who's the boss of the ring? So who is the boss? Of, well, who's this book about? Who is the boss of the, the ring? Is he really? Does he own the ring? Does he master the ring? He knows how to use it. Fine. Yeah, but does he use it? No, he can't. He can't. The whole book is about him being unable to use it. He would very much like to use it, but he would very much like to own it. He created it, uh, but he doesn't own it, and he, uh, he can't control it. He seeks for it. So who's the Lord? In fact, if you go down and look at the packing order, if you destroy the ring, you destroy Mordor. So... Who is the Lord of the Rings? Hmm? The ring itself, exactly. This is called, in uh, psychoanalytic psychology, object petit a. It is something that was created to be controlled. It gets a life of its own. As you know, the ring has a will of its own. It gets alive and it starts controlling you. Now, this is an ancient uh, archetype, pretty much like we in one of the oldest stories, God created us, we got out of control, we created something, machines, ring, whatever, it got out of control. You can see the same motive in Matrix. 
we've created some machines to slave us, blah, 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 something happened, they got a life of their own, and now we are enslaved to the machines. Same story from uh, Aladdin and his lamp. He had the jinn to serve him, at the end of the time, the jinn got out, or artificial intelligence, AI. Again, we created robots, they got the life of their own, they started having their own, blah, blah, blah. You can go, even Kundera. Kundera's stories are all linked around one basic topic. Somebody, usually a man, starts usually a sexual game with a female because he thinks it's a game, he can control it, blah, 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 something happens. At the end of the time, the man is a slave of that game. He can't help it. He must, the game is playing him, so to speak. So from a puppeteer, you become a puppet. Um, Unbearable lightness of being is a good example, uh, or, the, well anyway, most of his stories are, are built around that. Or, I don't know if you've seen the movie The Mask with Jim Carrey. That's a good example. The mask starts controlling the, the owner. Okay, so, what to do with the ring of power that is too big a temptation to be controlled? Also, please mark that none of the great wizards and all the great minds in uh, Tolkien's stories never touched the ring. Gandalf never touched the ring. Galadriel, Elrond, uh, Aragorn didn't touch the ring. Why didn't they? Why didn't they use it? This was Boromir's idea. Let's use the ring. Yeah, they were afraid that this would be so tempting. That it would be a temptation too difficult for them to carry. So, the advice was, this is too powerful for us to control. It can control us. The ring must be destroyed. Same thing happened with monetary policy. When politicians had the right to print money at will, it became a temptation too difficult to withhold, that's why monetary policy had to be destroyed and given to somebody who is politically independent and who's actually ignorant of what you can do with printing money. Pretty much like Frodo and Bilbo, they had no clue what they're carrying, especially Bilbo. He thought that it was a sort of a joker ring that is nice to entertain your company during, during parties. But he had no clue what he has. So our civilization, first of all, created uh, sorry national banks that are independent, except for in Hungary, um, of of, uh, of, uh, of politicians. And the second step, most countries in Europe actually adopted the euro, thus making monetary policy even more independent of any national political interest. Now, what's the difference between... Okay, again, the reason is that just imagine that you in your university, right next door, you have a legal money printing device. Which one of you would not use it? You can just come there and print as much money as you want. Nobody's going to stop you. You all know, because you're studying economics sometimes, that with every single uh, zloty that you print, you are adding to general inflation. But quite frankly, who cares? Monetary policy is briefly said, it's the right to the monopoly of printing money. I'm simplifying here, but I hope you take my meaning. Fiscal policy is a monopoly to the right of printing debt. Now, the problem of Europe is that we are exactly in the middle. This power has been destroyed. This power is full and blue. This is one reason why we don't have a monetary problem. We don't have a problem with inflation. We don't have a problem with devaluation. We have an excessive problem with debt. Why? Because one hand is tied behind our back and we're trying to do everything we can with the dead hand. And the debate as of today is whether we should lose both hands so that we can fight the crisis even with uh, monetary policy 
or whether we should also tie the second hand and destroy, so to speak, the ring of power of, uh, of the fiscal policy. Because at the end of the day, this is printing debt, uh, sorry, this is printing money, this is printing debt. Uh, you end up, there is no reason why politicians, this, this should have been um, uh, confiscated and, and this still exists. 